now I would like to invite you, uh, the uh, moderator and the speakers of the last session, a very interesting debate on laparoscopic rectopexy, resection versus no resection. So the chairperson of uh, this particular debate is Dr. Vandana Soni. And uh, as we all know, she is the director of, Mac of laparoscopic minimal access metabolic and bariatric surgery at Max Super Speciality Hospital at Saket in Gurgaon, uh, sorry, in Delhi. And uh, we have the two speakers, uh, Dr. Suviraj and Dr. Lakshmi. Uh, so, Dr. Suvira John is a consultant laparoscopic and robotic surgeon impaneled at the Sir Gangaram Hospital. And Dr. Lakshmi Kona Kumari is a senior consultant in surgical gastroent gastroenterology, minimal access GI surgery, and bariatric surgery at Glen Eagles Hospital, Hyderabad. Both are uh, very well known, and uh, actually, all three of them. Are, and uh, we look forward to a great session on laparoscopic rectopexy. Over to you, Dr. Vandana. Are you there? Dr. Vandana? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Minachi. Thank you. Yes, I'm very much there. And uh, I think this is the last session yes. uh, before the plenary sessions begin. And uh, before, without much ado, I think I don't want to take too much of the speaker's time. Uh, this session is going to be a debate on lack laparoscopic rectopexy, resection versus no resection. Now, as mentioned in the program, there's been a switch of topic between the speakers mutually. So we are first going to have uh, Dr. Subira John speaking to us about uh, laparoscopic rec rectopexy uh, without resection. So uh, do we have Dr. Subira online? Yes, I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, Dr. Suvira. So, Dr. Suvira, as uh, Dr. Binakshi mentioned, is uh, a senior consultant and at IMAS uh, at Sir Gangaram Hospital. Extensive experience he has in minimal access and uh, coloproctology. And looking forward uh, to your uh, uh, your debate, your session, uh, Dr. Suvira. You have ten minutes to present your. Uh, uh, points in your favor, and then we'll move yeah. over to Dr. Lakshmi before, before we have the report. Uh, just a small update. We have some more time because the plenary session has been postponed by around 10 to 15 minutes. So we can have five minutes each more from each speaker. So I think that Thank depends upon that, that is, uh, yeah. of course, uh, uh, yeah. at an advantage. Seems, I'll try to keep the time, and then we can, we can use it for discussion, maybe. Yes, Thank we you. can have a slightly longer time for discussion. Yeah. May I start? Yes, yes, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Minakshi, for the very kind introduction. It's a wonderful uh, experience to be back, although in a virtual sense. My duty this evening is to, um, is to you know, defend my position of a laparoscopic rectopexy without uh, resection uh, for rectal prolapse. In, by saying rectal prolapse, I mean in the adult, a uh, full thickness rectal prolapse. And let me start by saying that this is actually a therapy which is continuously still evolving. And back to, against the background clinically, which is highly heterogeneous and pleomorphic. So one needs to be very careful before we actually make broad sweeping statements. A little context, uh, pelvic floor disorders amongst which Rectal prolapse comes, although it's a minority in terms of our total polar proctology work, but it's still a significant, um, you know, part of our surgical work. I hope I'm audible now. I've taken off my mask. And although in comparison to rectal cancer, our laparoscopic practice as an institution has been lagging behind, uh, there are still a number of surgeons who actually perform a uh, perineal procedure for uh, with old people for rectal prolapse. This is a comparative statistic with the rectal cancer. You can see there's a far data uptake. The central question here we have today is should we excise or resect the redundant sigmoid? And can we tolerate the issue of anastomotic breakdown? It is my position that a laparoscopic rectopexy without a resection is a solid, rugged procedure with good long term outcomes and that you really can't accept the morbidity and sometimes the rare mortality associated with a resection and as, uh, associated anastomotically. A quick snapshot, overall resective procedures 
as you can see, whether it's open or laparoscopic, have a better or a more successful outcomes in terms of recurrence, lower recurrence, but they have a significant, all on the recent, but still not negligible morbidity, and yes, even in certain cases, mortality. This needs to be taken into context as we step into the minimal access arena. Laparoscopic and robotic surgery gives us many benefits of minimal access surgery. You can see a list of them here, and this has been a game changer apart from the minimal access advantage for rectal cancer, uh, for rectal prolapse. How so? It has now made it far more possible and safer for us to bring the elderly category of patients into a trans-abdominal procedure for laparoscopic or robotic access. Now, when we come into objective, hard-nosed comparison between resective and non-resective procedures, we must accept the limitations that we don't have a lot of publications with head-to-head -head comparisons. There is a selection bias. If the surgeon likes the procedure, he does it predominantly. And there's a huge variation in technique. There's almost more than 100 types of approaches and procedures for rectal prolapse literature. But over the last few years, if not decades, there's been a focus not just on restoring the anatomy, there's also a focus on restoring physiological function and preserving it. Thus, the MDP is, approach is valid today, and we start to look at this through very hard-nosed clinical outcome measures. I'm going to quote a few simple studies to highlight my position. In 2015, we had a Cochrane uh, group analysis. They looked at primary outcomes and secondary outcomes in a head-to-head -head comparison. They only found three studies with six criteria for a comparison between resection and non-resection. Primary outcomes mainly relating to success in relation to recurrence, as well as incontinence and constipation. Secondary outcomes relating to quality of life and physiological indices. What they found was for recurrence as well as fecal incontinence, there was really no difference between the two categories. But in terms of constipation, there was significantly less constipation with the resection group. This might sound like a support for uh, resection, which seems to be supported by other evidence. But when you come down to the quality of life indices, there's, there's greater compliance when you look at uh, non resective procedures and gut transit time, which is a uh, function of constipation was supported in this. Central to the issue of the debate, maybe we can come into the Q&A session for this when we have a discussion, is the issue of whether we dissect or transect the lateral ligaments or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a resection. The central issue is constipation. Constipation de novo occurs after a resectomy, which is non resective The reasons for this are many, some related to mesh placement, some related to the excision of the lateral ligaments, which actually transect the parasympathetic supply to the rectum. This has been shown to cause constipation and avoiding transaction uh, has been shown to prevent this. However, the evidence for this is early and now we are actually having people who do partial transaction or even nerve-preserving rectal activity. And I come to a little bit more detail from the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons. They have some statements published in 2017. They largely support the transabdominal rectal sexy with SNC rectal fixation as a central theme. They believe there's insufficient evidence to choose, you know, resection rectal sexy over something like the anterior ventral or the ventral rectal sexy. A quick note. Uh, we believe in our institution to do a laparoscopic fecal rectopexy as a method of choice after counseling the patient, and thus we mitigate. We don't transect the lateral stock, uh, thus we preserve the parasympathetic supply, and we now actually move to a ventral rectopexy, and we've abandoned the posterior mesh rectopexy because that involved more of a circumferential dissection of the rectum. Now, we see in future rectopexy, we have excellent outcomes in terms of recurrence and morbidity and mortality. This, when you compare with a resection vectorpexy, there is a non-negligible mortality rate, although the recurrence rate is comparable. Just a note about posterior mesh vectorpexy, although done in the past, we've abandoned it in relation to the resection of the lateral ligament. And we now have actually moved on to ventral mesh vectorpexy briefly, uh, using non absorbable mesh. And now actually the counseling patients to use uh, absorbable meshes as supposed to reduce the risk of mesh related complications. And here we actually achieve a double kill. 
Not only do we bring up the rectum and fix it, we also suspend the pelvic floor, which may descend uh, at training. A quick note about to highlight the laparoscopic ventral rectopexy. I've chosen one study from the recent part in 2017, where they actually performed the ventral rectopexy, a laparoscopic robotic or an open one, to even treat recurrent sexual prolapse. And what they found was good outcomes for both primary and secondary rectopexy. And yes, the uh, people who had a primary repair went a day earlier to the recurrent uh, prolapse patients. Uh, however, the overall complication rates are comparable between the two. And this I must highlight is because we don't mobilize the rectum. We only mobilize anteriorly. The denominator fascia go into the rectovaginal septum all the way down to the perineal body. And then we place a mesh and fix it in a mildly loose fashion to take a promontory. And that's the operation. You don't transect circumferentially, you don't transect the lateral stop. And we also found in this study that the recurrences, if they occurred, were largely in the recurrent group. And these usually occurred much early in this group compared to 30 months in the primary group. Overall, whether it was a primary or a secondary repair, the quality of life was much, much better. As you can see, through all these different tools from the Cleveland Clinic Global Quality of Life Index to the other quality of life indices we have mentioned. So the take-home message with a laparoscopic ventral rectopexy, which is essentially a nerve-preserving mesh rectopexy, is an excellent modality for primary and secondary uh, rectal prolapse. A note that in the case of the primary procedure being a delome or a perineal rectopexy, there is a slightly higher chance of recurrence. Coming back to the focus, which I believe is going to be part of the debate, is the issue of constipation, which may arise de novo if you transect the ligament, and it can be mitigated in some cases by doing a resection. We believe that now with a nerve sparing and a lateral ligament sparing surgery, we have mitigated this, and we can, many people, avoid constipation by lifestyle change and by dietary supplements. Uh, and we believe that a head-to-head -head comparison in the future may be delineated better by these upcoming trials in Germany, Denmark, and the UK. So evidence is evolving, but for the larger surgical population and professional community, we believe in experienced hands and also in terms who are learning that you can provide good long-term results with a laparoscopic vector protection. You can optimize the results by employing a multidisciplinary approach excellent clinical evaluation and lab evaluation, especially a dynamic MRI, as well as good patient selection, do your technique well, and avoid constipation by preserving the lateral ligament. You do that by anti retrospective and also with medical management. Please reserve the sigmoid resection only for those with intractable constipation with a very redundant uh, sigmoid colon, and especially a note about complications for a purely benign elective procedure. It's very hard for a surgeon to explain a life threatening or a major surgical complication relating to anastomosis, especially in the elderly. So, I believe in our uh, context, in our native setting, uh, laparoscopic non resective retrospective is the best option for most people. Thank you very much. I hope that is audible. Yes, thank you, Dr. Suviraj. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that was uh, a fairly good uh, uh, front or uh, uh, step forward to, towards uh, defending your topic on uh, laparoscopic rectopexy. Let's hear what Dr. Lakshmi has to say. Dr. Lakshmi, uh, she is currently the head of department of uh, at Glen Eagles in uh, minimal access and GI surgery department. Over to Dr. Lakshmi, very dear friend and an excellent presenter. So looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Lakshmi, before we come back to Dr. Siviraj. Uh, I will thank... Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Siviraj, you'll have to stop sharing your screen so that we can... Already I've already done that. Yes, okay, all right. Okay, so Vandana, thank you for the introduction and hi Suraj. 
um, Minakshi, and um, uh, I will uh, define my uh, position on the section rector pexy. Uh, Suvira gave an excellent uh, description of the procedure. Actually, it is individualistic based. It depends upon uh, the person. Why this is not moving? Who is going to get the procedure? We cannot just give a uniform procedure to uh, everyone. So, uh, coming to what is resection re rectopexy is when we remove a part of the sigmoid colon and re restore the continuity, and then we also add the rectopexy to it. It's only just for the resection, so it's resection plus a rectopexy. And specifically, it is used for patients who have constipation as a main complaint. So there are patients who will have normal bowel movements with the prolapse and they'll be having constipation with prolapse. So if you are doing only a rectopexy, it could be a anterior or a posterior rectopexy, the constipation never improves. And most of these patients are over time got fixed to that bowel movement because most of them would have ended with this uh, prolapse because they have been constantly straining to pass the stool. So if they are not able to correct the constipation part in whom constipation is a significant complaint, then they will be never happy even if their rectum is not prolapsing out, but still they'll be never happy because they are so bothered about the constipation and they'll continue to strain, which is a very negative predictor when they're doing a rectopexy. So if we are able, and it has been shown that resection rectopexy gives a significant improvement in the constipation and also improves in the functional status with only decreasing the recurrence rate significantly. So this I will, so you have to get the patient through a whole lot of investigations, mainly because here you are going to resect the bowel. So apart from the manometry and all you should do at least the sigmoidoscopy to make sure there is nothing it's within the sigmoid colon um, uh, not some obstructing growth or not some obstructing polyp and uh, uh, difficogram is a must to see the degree of prolapse and the fecal incontinence score severity should be assessed and the patient should be mechanically prepared i will just show you a short video so because to understand what the uh, procedure entails so that's the port placement the patient is in uh, lithotomy and then uh, the ports are placed so that we have adequate uh, triangulation so why i wanted to show the video is to see that when they have a large you can see that's the large redundant sigmoid so when they have a large redundant sigmoid and we just mobilizing the rectum and then fixing it is not going to solve the problem because the sigmoid is going to again convolute and bend on itself and going to aggravate the constipation. So a quick short video where the rectum is uh, mobilized. So we are going in the TME plane till we reach the pelvic floor and uh, we have to be very careful when uh, not to take down the lateral ligaments, both for uh, not aggravating the constipation and also to maintain the sexual function, especially in a male patient. So, this is actually the uh, total TME plane and you have to be very careful that you don't damage the uh, nerves. And then you go anteriorly because we are going to Resect, so we have to totally uh, circumferentially mobilize the rectum. So we keep a gauze around the rectum to help us have a grip on the rectum and we are not pulling on the rectum to create any serosal tear. So here the rectum is stored and there we are reaching the pelvic floor. You can see the glistening structure is the pelvic floor and then we anti go around anteriorly. Release all the peritoneal attachments of rectum and then we transect the rectum 
just at the rectosigmoid and then we and proximally we transect the at the the descending colon and make sure that the the descending colon comes down easily and then we use a circular stapler to do the anastomosis and later the rectum is pulled up and fixed to the sacral promontory using couple of non absorbable sutures so this actually straightens the rectum and also removes the redundant sigmoid so these patients feel very comfortable in the post op one is their prolapse is gone and also the constipation which was troubling them and which was a constant uh, mental fixation for them uh, gets relieved so if in a patient you have constipation then a resection rectopexy if they have normal bowel habits and then a suture rectopexy is advisable so the major benefits being improved in quality of life in more than 80% of the patient and most of this 80% of patients are the ones who are having constipation as one of the major complaints the very less recurrent rate in the uh, prolapse happening and because we are doing it all the minimal access method the hospitalization is short and there is less degree of analgesia uh, requirement and and the outcomes are almost they are normal with the correction of two things one is the prolapse and one and the other is their uh, constipation and we have a uh, uh, i'll just come back this uh, with this uh, we have one study where they have observed in 40 patients over 18 months and they found that the results are pretty much good when compared to only suture rectopexy but also these patients should have a uh, biofeedback being done to them and also a change in their uh, uh, diet schedule because lot of them may not be uh, constipation could have other uh, uh, reasons so they should also be simultaneously corrected along with the resection rectopexy so i would say that wherever a patient has significant constipation and the first complaint to the patient is apart from the prolapse is constipation then i would prefer to do a resection rectopexy and with improvement in our experience of doing laparoscopic colorectal procedures our leak rate is very minimal so we should not use leak as one reason for not doing a resection rectopexy and leaving the patient to suffer from the constipation and which in turn the constant straining would again cause to lead to a recurrence so back to vandana okay thank you dr lakshmi that was short and crisp and uh, uh, the message i think you want to give is that let's be let's customize the procedure to the complaints of the patient uh, seems acceptable uh, dr suviraj you have a few extra minutes with you to yes. present uh, your I, arguments against yes yes uh, thank you very much uh, lovely presentation dr lakshmi uh, you know we are in a debate so let me just complete the debate function here uh, i really believe and i'm sure all of you agree that the real purpose of the debate is to bring out and highlight the individualities and the nuances and technique and approach so let me uh, start with where you ended you mentioned that uh, Uh, for the benefit of the audience, as you mentioned that your leak rate, you know, in experienced hands like yours is very low. Uh, but in an elderly patient who has a full cystic rectal prolapse, uh, you do have to counsel them. So, do you take the decision upon yourself to go ahead and do the procedure? Do you let them know about like a covering ileostomy? So that, that becomes another procedure. Uh, how do you approach this issue of uh, mitigating the risk of leak? I know you have the experience. How would you advise others to approach? See, I would uh, mean if someone wants to do a resection rectopexy, then they should be sure of their uh, colonal procedures or their bowel anastomosis. I would not suggest that some because here most of these are like you said are elderly patients or in in beyond their middle age. who will not tolerate any complications like a mainly a leak because that is the one thing which will trouble them but at the same time if you have a elderly patient 
who has that because constipation is one of the uh, troublesome features of the aging so if you have an elderly patient unhappy with the his bowel movements and they're constantly uh, straining to pass stool it is that in the post op period they'll never be happy so what i would suggest to anyone that if you want to do this type of procedures first you should improve your result rate because for a patient who comes with constipation we say that i want to give you ileostomy or you leak and you will go on to a ventilator if you say those things the patient will never get rid of the primary problem which has come up so that will reduce the quality of life so for whoever who wants to do this procedures i would say that let us not cling on to the complication which may happen we should try our best even if it's 1% that 1% should be minimized it should not happen that 1% should not happen and we should take all precautions if we are not sure then we will tell them so many complications for that 1% which can happen and then we give them a procedure which is not going to totally correct the complaint which they came with so uh Dr. Suvirai, would you like to add something to that? Uh, any any counter argument yeah, that? Uh, not really a counter argument. Uh, maybe a small point at the end of it. Uh, I would like to, you know, this is goes for me as well. I think I'll just maybe reverse the question to Lakshmi. What is your threshold for deciding? Because anywhere from thirty to seventy percent uh, patients who come with rectal prolapse have constipation, which may be functional, which may be slow transit. How do you? Talk this out, especially in the day and age of specialized investigations and multidisciplinary research. Which I believe is the way to go forward. How do you uh, sort that out? Where do you decide that this patient needs a resection? Where do you decide that the patient will do just well with the uh, non-resection? Yeah. See, uh, because as I said, constipation is multifactorial. But where the constipation is getting aggravated by a very redundant sigmoid. then we only uh, counsel them for a resection rectopexy so normally if there is a patient who says that i am taking lot of laxatives and my bowel movements are not good they will have a particular type of description which you understand that these patients have have a got, got a very um, what uh, difficult uh, type of constipation so like we have to counsel them that when we if we see a redundant sigmoid we are going to we don't just tell the patient you are put for uh, uh, resection rectopexy right on right when we see them in the opd that's very difficult to decide but once we go inside and there is a patient who has a very difficult constipation you see a large redundant sigmoid like in the video i showed you that's why i put up that video to see that you have a large sigmoid just falling all over then you proceed for a resection rectopexy but if you have a reasonable sigmoid and the patient has constipation then you you don't go for a uh, resection rectopexy then you do the other things like you, you know, the fiber diet and uh, the biofeedback and all that has to be added so whenever a patient is with a constipation both in with going to open mind we take uh, consent for a plus minus resection rectopexy because to know how much of redundancy of sigmoid is there is very difficult pre op even if you do a ct maybe it will not tell you how much of redundancy is there so always a patient with a very difficult constipation is taken with a consent of plus minus resection rectopexy to be done and it's the on table decision okay uh, one question for both of you and that is uh, uh, i think dr lakshmi is arguing on the base this is that uh, uh resection is indicated in patients uh, who have primarily constipation as a com complaint uh, associated with a rectal prolapse now uh, uh, what is your take on laparoscopic ventral rectopexy i think that also uh, has a, an almost equal uh, you know uh, provides equal relief from constipation in these patients suppose you go in and you see a patient who doesn't have a, a very redundant uh, sigmoid then would you uh, you know uh, counsel the patient of a possibility of uh, either a resection or a ventral rectopexy in that case yes all all patients who have constipation as a significant complaint are yes. always 
so, or both uh, proceed. I, it can be either, depending upon that. Uh, Dr. Suviraj, would you agree with that? Uh, just come again, please. I missed that. So what I was saying, we are talking basically for customizing the procedure to the complaints of the patient. Right. Patient of uh, complete rectal prolapse presenting with uh, constipation or probably in patients who give a history of uh, severe constipation preceding the prolapse. That means the prolapse evolved because of constipation. Right. In those patients, yeah. uh, would you offer a, a resection straight away or would you give them a choice that if it, it's the redundant uh, sigmoid, uh, or, or a very large or long redundant sigmoid, the resection may be better. And if it is not so, maybe a ventral retrofexy may be the answer to their uh, problems. Right. Uh, let me just tell you a few things before I come into that. Um, our outlook for treating rectal prolapse has taken a big shift now, especially after we started evaluating as a routine maybe over the last five years to a dynamic MRI. Why do I say that? Because we often recognize concomitants pelvic organ prolapse in the apical and in the anterior compartment. Secondly, we are also checking for pelvic foot distent. This is something that resection retrospective doesn't address, I believe, adequately. So when I do uh, anterior mesh retrospective, I go all the way down to the perineal body, and my first stitch is often take you know, the attenuated perineal body to bend adequately the pelvic floor. Now, why is that important? Because when you do a functional test like a dynamic MRI, you also check out pelvic floor dysfunction, which is often missed, and these surgeons often look at the chest prolapse in a two-dimensional way, in a monocular way, but this is an anatomical problem requiring a mechanical fix. This is much more than that, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, Lakshmi also agrees. So, like you mentioned, another 30 to 70 percent patients who are not constipated, who have maybe a pelvic floor dysfunction, also with a mesh anti-vector fix with counseling to the patient that intro up if you find a very redundant uh, colon or a, or a sigmoid, we may do a resection. But again, we are happy to do a resection in a fit patient. Otherwise, uh, if the absence of constipation is a significant problem, we offer anti mesh retrospective, which is a, uh, a default choice. But our threshold for placing a mesh is now going up, especially with adverse reports in the West, as well as litigant activity. So a suture retrospective along with, uh, you know, quick uh, lifestyle change for smaller variants, we are taking it up first. Otherwise, it's an anterior mesh retrospective. You know, probably going to start with a more biological. But I think the complete evaluation in an MDP format, I even get sometimes a psychiatric review, and even a colon transit science for people who have, you know, I suspect a global mortality disorder. So that is also there. I think the outlook of the comprehensive evaluation, your outlook is change with that and then I think become better at choosing which one and as Dr. Rakshmi said you have the experience uh, you know in select patients go ahead but otherwise I think avoid a uh, resection vector. Uh, okay thank you Dr. Saviraj uh, I think that was a good argument. Dr. Lakshmi one more question for you. Uh, so so far you have spoken about uh, uh, performing a resection rectopexy because of uh, complaints of constipation. What about patients who present with incontinence? Yeah, if in incontinence, you should never do a resection rectopexy. Because so you because you're taking that? Accelerate. Yeah. Whenever they are incontinent, you have to find out incontinence is because of a long-standing prolapse, whether the sphincters, the anal sphincters have got weakened now. If they end, then they need uh, to train, retrain them after the, we, and we never do a resection pexy, resection rectopexy for a patient who has incontinence. You should never do. Because whatever little constipation that would be there once you straighten the rectum will actually help them with the incontinence they are having. This, along with the other uh, uh, physiological things like biofeedback and uh, stimulating the anal sphincters and sphincter exercises and all will help them. Should never, we never offer a resection rectopexy for anyone with any sort of incontinence. Okay, there was one very interesting argument or uh, uh, point that Dr. Suviraj put forth, and that was uh, regarding uh, litigation uh, with the use of mesh. And uh, so their preference for uh, uh, a suture rectopexy. What is your take on that? Yeah, we have uh, abandoned using mesh for almost 15 years. We have not used the mesh in all the 15 years of our rectopexy. 
so uh, in in patients where you are not doing a resection patients of incontinence what would you prefer to do in that suture ectopexy you are doing a suture ectopexy yeah. uh, what about your experience with the perineal uh, uh, resections perineal resections are only reserved for patients who are very frail and who will not be able to tolerate uh, general anesthesia or a pneumoperitoneum and then we do them under uh, spinal procedures the very the frail people they on their only we do a perineal resection okay so i think both the um, uh, debaters uh, seem to agree on a common point that mesh should preferably be avoided although i think uh, laparoscopic ventral uh, mesh uh, rectopexy has uh, created a niche for itself and is doing pretty well uh, yes certainly in terms of uh, litigation i suppose uh, going in for uh, uh, a suture rectopexy in patients uh, who are incontinent and uh, depending upon the anatomical anomaly associated with constipation a resection or a suture rectopexy is what is the way forward for managing these uh, uh, complex problems and apart from a rectopexy i think uh, a lot that is required is uh, helping the patient manage the post procedural problems and training them again for a normal bowel habits to avoid straining and uh, helping in making the procedure successful so i think uh, uh, with that uh, uh, very difficult to decide i think we will agree with both of you because uh, it all depends upon the customization it is ultimately to customize the procedure to the patient and uh, for sure one thing is for sure that uh, a laparoscopic approach is certainly indicated in almost all patients until and unless the patient is very old unfit for anesthesia and extremely frail there that is the only time when you can go in for a perineal otherwise uh, a laparoscopic uh, rectopexy whether suture or ventral or uh, resection both will stand the test of time and both will be applicable in different situations and different patients i thank both the debaters for an excellent presentation thank, thank you very you. much and over to you dr minakshi i think uh, we finished well in time although i i'm aware that we had some extra time but i think both the uh, uh, both presenters were extremely well prepared had timed their presentation well and i think we've had a good discussion so over to you minakshi thank you very much thank you dr lakshmi thank you dr sivaraj thank you Thank, thank you, you dr vamana dr lakshmi and dr suviraj it was an excellent deliberation and uh, the points were well taken there wasn't any need for more time because everything was driven home so on that note i would like to thank you all and uh, we'll move on to the plenary sessions from now on thank you very much thank you